Hello everyone, I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. We have a special guest with us. Can you tell us who you are? Uh, the Reverend Shane Hubner, priest in charge at the Anglican Parish of Christchurch, St Lucia. Excellent. And before we start, I just want to acknowledge the lands on which we meet and acknowledge our elders past, present and emerging. And because we're going to be talking about the environment, obviously want to acknowledge the work that Indigenous people are doing um, on the land and, and for the environment and how we need to care for the land. So I just want to start with what's your assessment on how we're doing when it comes to climate change? Because it's obviously been in the media a lot over many years. How do you yeah, think we're actually yeah, doing? I, I, I thought, um, well, the short answer, David, is not well enough. Um, I think um, it's fairly obvious that there's more talk than real action um, and that it, it can sometimes be considered a wicked problem. Um, in the sense that uh, where do you start? But uh, I've been looking at the, the two things which I think the United Nations Environment Agency talk about is one is mitigation, and that, that's the um, cutting, cutting the greenhouse gases or improving the, the sinkholes that um, capture the emissions. Um, and, um, and the... 65% of the carbon dioxide is through the burning of fossil fuels. I mean, it's it's not rocket science that we need to be moving to a carbon neutral economy. Uh, the other thing that the United Nations is now working on and talking about, and it was raised um, at the last IPC, IPCC report, was uh, adaptation. The fact that we've built in uh, an, a, a level of climate change and that the world needs to be more resilient and more focused on adapting our, our, our infrastructure, our agriculture, our food security and all of that to the fact that the climate will change. Um, so uh, I don't think we're doing enough, is the short answer. I'm, I'm trying to... Uh, it's, it's hard because in one sense you, you're working at several levels. There's the, the global level... There's the national level and then there's the local level. And sometimes the work that we do at the local level never seems to be doing much. Um, but I, I'm more of a, a person that says everything that we do and every action that a government can take and everything that the globe can take is going to lessen the outcome. That um, it's no use putting our heads in the sand. Um, we need to act even, in, uh, even if we're facing... Um, terrible terrible changes ahead that doesn't stop the fact that we need to we need to still act so yeah i don't think we're doing well <laughs> and what do you base that on like for you what's the metric is it the temperature is it the frequency of disasters how for you oh, what's no, well, not I mean, doing well me first, it would be um the, the ipcc reports i mean coming out um who just keep saying that uh we're not doing enough you know we're, we're the um adaptation fund they're talking about having $350 billion needed per year to help developing countries uh, adapt and become more resilient. Uh, richer, com com uh, richer countries are only given a tenth of that. You know, they're so on a financial level, we're not giving enough money. On um, The results are that the uh, parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere it keeps rising. Um, so... They the window of opportunity for saying that we're going to stay under 1.5 is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, now people are worried that uh, actually we're past that and we should be trying to keep it under two. So that's the type of metrics I would use, David, that um, every, every scientific evidence says that we're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to actually doing something, what works, what doesn't? Because there seems to be a lot of different approaches. Some people, you know, glue themselves to the road. Some people are lobbying governments. Yeah. What um, works or doesn't work? Yeah, I'm a little bit of a horses for courses. I'm I'm not sold on um, the climate uh, extension rebellions direct action model yet. Um, I think I'm... <laughs> I'm probably old enough and too comfortable in my lifestyle. I'm more of a gradualist. I'm more of a softly, softly uh, catches the monkey. Uh, I, I think there's a couple of battles that you've got to, that you're fighting all the time. And one of the battles is public opinion. 
and my problem with the work that Extinction Rebellion does and gluing hands to floors and um, stopping traffic and they make a noise, they get a splash in the headlines um, and it and it raises a bit of public awareness, but maybe the public opinion is against that. Um, so I'm trying, my thing that works is definitely raising awareness, uh, awareness raising campaigns, uh, presenting clear facts, but also providing actions that everyday people can do. Um, putting and, and getting our lobbying um, to the people that make real change. And, that, and that's got to be, uh, it's got to be the industry and it's got to be government. I mean, I'm not 100% sure that the direct action approach works. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm yet to be convinced. I mean, if, if they can convince me otherwise, yeah, I'll be, I'll be um, manning the barricades. But at the moment, I don't think it works. Mm -hmm. and, and by work, you would have to see like a policy that's changed, that's directly linked to that direct action. True, yeah. 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 Um, what about governments? How does that come into it? Do they listen to you? Do you think that's a, a, a good approach? Does do, do governments listen? Um, well, yes and no. I mean, um, we can be cynical about anything, you know. I mean, you've got to take the fact that these are people of goodwill. Um, I'm a person of faith. I would believe that I don't want to impute bad motives on people. I think there are a lot of um, people of goodwill on both sides of the political divide who think this, this is uh, the issue of our day. Um, but they're working within a very difficult set of circumstances. One eye on the budget, one eye on re-election, one eye on uh, keeping things afloat, one eye on uh, national defence. Um, all these other issues crowd out um, action that might seem too much of a political gamble. So do they listen? Yes. But do they act? Well, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And what about the messaging by environmentalists? I was seeing something from Arnold Schwarzenegger recently where he says, forget about talking about climate change. You've got to talk about pollution because they can see that. It's right there. It's killing people right now. Climate change, they kind of just zone out. Yep. Um, so you're talking about how we go about the messaging. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, I mean, people are well aware of the rise of um, uh, disasters, uh, environmental disasters around the world. I mean, the... The, the bushfires in Canada sweeping. Arnie's got a point that uh, smog and pollution in American capitals is on the news. <laughs> I mean, the bushfires here in uh, 1920, it's on the news. Three billion animals died, you know, in the, in the, in the bushfire summer. Um, making the link between that and me, um, me doing the right thing and, and recycling and not buying plastics and things, uh, I think is better than uh, pure numbers or 1.5 or mm -hmm. um yes it's it's more emotive and i'm i'm wary of um emotional language and using emotion to change behavior i'm not sure that that always works and people can become a bit uh what would you say numb to it all mm -hmm. and then if you put too much of bad news before people then they're just going to bear their heads in the sand and and say what can we do it's all it's all a lost cause Mm -hmm. So critics, you know, will say things like, oh, well, we've always had natural disasters or you've been talking about Bangladesh going underwater since the 70s. Yeah, yes. What's yes. the kind of response to that? Ah, to, ah, to the critics. Um, I, I really, you've got to remain confident, you've got to remain persistent and you've got to have the facts in front of you. The, the classic one is we only, Australia only uh, produces 1.3% of carbon emissions. That's such a small thing compared to what China does in the United States. Why should we bother and why should we turn our whole economy upside down for 1.3%? And when you have a clear argument that says, well, 1.3% um, may be at the total emissions, but per capita, it's, it's uh, we're only 0.3% of the world's population. So if you take it per capita, we're way up there with the worst polluters around the world. Um, when you include coal exports, um, and the true um, value of what Australia produces, our emissions go from 1.3 to something like 4.4, 4.5%, which makes us the sixth or seventh largest uh, polluter in the world. The other thing is that um, we always talk about punching above our weight when it comes to sport and technology. And earth. Well, I would have thought that it's a good story that we should be punching above our weight in terms of responding to climate change and 
maybe small, but we're the 14th largest country in the world in terms of emissions. There's 190 odd behind us. We could be the leader of a pack of people, a pack of countries that says, all right, combined, we're, we're 60, uh, we're 34% of the, uh, the pollution of the planet. Why aren't we doing something about it? Mm -hmm. So presenting facts clearly, rationally, um, and stripping it of emotion, um, I think is a way to, to beat back critics. But um, I don't know, uh, the shock jocks and there's a lot of money behind it and there's a lot of votes on the far right for this but yeah i'm i'm i've tried to remain calm and 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 um patient with critics david fundamentally do you think people can change the way that they live i mean do they need to change or can you say oh, we'll just get technology and that'll fix it but oh, you know are um, people uh, going to kind of stop driving and you know live off the grid you know things like that do you think we yeah. can actually change uh, i think i mean covid is a case in point. I think um, when push comes to shove, um, we can change our behaviour. Um, and you'd rather do it um, for carrots rather than sticks. You know, you'd rather act while you still can rather than being forced into doing it. Um, one of the things I think uh, our parish has just bit the bullet and we've brought on the EV vehicle. You know, we're putting, uh, we're going diamond energy for our electricity use. We're putting solar panels on. Uh, we're getting, uh, building a community garden and so forth. We're doing what we can. I think people's behaviour can change. Um, you just got to find the right motivators. Uh, for some people, that's hip pocket, you know. So, for example, Plastic Free July is a great idea. Uh, Angela Green supporting it uh, tremendously. But I, you go into any major supermarket and you come try and come out with no plastic. You know, there's it's it's hard. So what's the consumer got to do? Um, so I think pe people's behaviour will change when it's more easily available for them to change. Um, a, a small case is the the plastic bags, um, the um, withdrawal of uh, straws, drinking straws, that type of thing. Uh, yes, I'm I'm an incrementalist. Uh, I see small behaviour changes. Uh, pre um, promote more bigger changes along the way. So, uh, yes, fundamentally people can change. Um, it's just it may not be easy. Will they have to do big changes? Do you envision that people will fundamentally have to change how they live their life or we will be able to find ways to kind of offset their damage or kind of get technology to do most of the work? Do you envision people will have to kind of just fundamentally change? I, I, no, I think, I think fundamentally we're going to have to change. I mean... Um, I'm I'm in my mid fifties now. I'm probably by the time I'm kicking off the planet, in another twenty thirty years is by the time that younger people are really suffering the effects of this, and we're going to have uh, major brownouts. We're going to have uh, uh, energy problems. We're going to have food problems and so forth. So, I really do think people will have to change. Um, I'm not a believer that technology will come to our rescue, and that we can just um, be blinkered about our behaviour. So, no, I'm thinking we need to be walking more, um, I'm using bicycles more. Um, we need to be growing food in our backyards more. We need to do a whole range of things. And, um, yes, um, I, would, I want, I want behaviour change above technology solutions. Mm -hmm. Why should Christians care about climate change? So we hear about, you know, care for creation, but... Fundamentally, why should a Christian care about sort of pollution and temperature rising? Yeah, yeah. um, well, um, uh, we believe in the God of creation. Um, uh, Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and all therein. Um, there's a sense in which uh, we are the products of the, the imagination of a creator God who created us all. Um, and not, it's not only about creation and the beauty of it, it's also about justice. I mean, we're, we are all uh, humanity created in the image of God and there's a justice issue to that all of us are uh, valued and equal before the sight of God. Um, and what gives the fact that I, through dint of my birth, live in a, a wealthy, rich country and I'm using... 17 times the resources of someone in sub-Saharan uh, Africa. So it's a justice issue. Also, the fact that 
the people that are uh, feeling the effects of climate change, first and foremost now, we, we can look at uh, our people in the Torres Strait and in the islands of uh, Queensland, our Pacific neighbours, they're the ones hey, that did the, the least to cause it and have the least resources to, um, to adapt to it. So not only is there a sense of creation theology and eco-theology um, that we are part of the natural system that God worked, it's also an issue of justice and social justice. Um, and that's why as a Christian, as a person of faith, um, I would believe that all Christians should be at the forefront of the environmental movement, not at the back. Mm -hmm. And have you met Christians who have said to you, look, we, we're not going to focus on the environment or we shouldn't be focusing? Yep. Why yeah, do they say that? There's there's an evangelical line, and I'm not, um, when I say that there's a an evangelical push to say that our main point for Christians is to save souls um, and that we um, people need to be saved for heaven um, and saved from hell. Um, and that is more important than devoting energy towards saving the planet. Um, uh, you can find scripture verses to back that up. There's a, there's a long, long tradition of, of that type of Christianity. Um, it's just not my cup of tea. I, I also say that if we don't have a planet, we're not going to have people to save. So um, I'm also not a believer in... Um, oh, yes, God's going to come in the rapture where all those are going to be saved are going to go to a heaven or even there's going to be a new Jerusalem um, descending from the clouds, um, if you read Revelations in a particular way. So, um, yeah, no, there, there are some Christians who say it, it's important, but it's not the number one priority. But they say that for a lot of things, you know. Uh, uh, that is the classic um, argument against any social justice work. Um, is the fact that you no, know, we should be we should be telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ who died for their sins. Um, so yeah, um, hats. I mean, fair enough. Um, and we're all Christians. We all believe in the God, but um, my God's a little bit bigger than that. I think. Can you tell us a little bit about Angler Green? Um, yeah, I've only just recently come to the diocese, and um, I've come from twelve years in Melbourne diocese, where I was the chair of the environmental subcommittee of the social responsibilities committee um, and in melbourne our work was towards turning the melbourne diocese into a uh, power plant using all the rooftops of all our buildings to actually be an energy provider um, uh, for people uh, who are energy uh, in energy deficit and who are who need energy um, so that was one of the things and the other thing we did in melbourne was um, finally after 10 years work get the diocesan council and the synod to agree to put some money towards a climate a mitigation officer for the diocese. So I've come to Queensland thinking, oh, well, what's happening here? Angler Green is the organisation um, working very closely with the Social Responsibilities Committee um, to provide um, education and resources to help Christians, Anglicans and parishes to, to be more environmentally aware and, and responsible. With the work that you did in Melbourne yep. to turn it into a kind of a, a power station, yep. what slowed the work down or what got, for those that sort of don't know the inner workings of doing things yeah, like no, this? Yeah, I no, mean, I think, I think uh, resources or the sense of the lack of resources. Um, the Anglican structure is a little diffuse, so um, it's very hard. We're not a Catholic. Um, you don't get a bishop saying uh, this is what should happen and every parish will do it. Um, we're a little bit more diffuse in um, in the Anglican system, and and when I say that that's what Melbourne they, they started the pilot program, um, so and that they need to have a pilot program so that they can prove to other people that it works. So that's the other thing. People, um, I think David, uh, if I'm honest, um, a lot of Anglican parishes and a lot of Anglican dioceses are worried at the moment about survival. Um, and keeping parishes um, open and viable and able to afford uh, full-time and part-time clergy. Um, while I would think that the environmental question is an existential question, um, the number one question, other people are more worried about, can we pay the bills next month? Um, mm -hmm. And so that's that's what is some of the, the stumbling blocks, is the fact that other people are more concerned. They're not saying no, 
but they're just saying, listen, there are other things more vital to our survival than this at the moment. Mm -hmm. And you make the argument that it's an existential threat, so you should kind of consider yep. giving that a lot more attention. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying uh, that the uh, keeping paying the bills isn't important, um, but I'm just saying this should be on the agenda. Um, it's one of the five marks of mission, um, you know, um, to safeguard um, the, the creation of the planet. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, your parish is linked to an award. Yes. The, Can you tell uh, us about that? Five you, Is it Five Leaf Eco Awards? Five Leaf Eco Awards, yes. I'm just trying to find my notes. I um, cheated. I looked at my notes too. Yeah, um, just hold on. Yeah, the uh, the Five Leaf Eco Awards are an Australian ecumenical environmental change program specifically designed for churches and religious organisations. And using a series of non-competitive awards, the program assists, inspires and rewards faith communities for taking environmental action and becoming more sustainable in response to God's call to care for creation. The Five Leaf Eco Awards encourage holistic environmental action um, for the environment, covering five areas of a parish's life. It's buildings, it's worship, it's congregational life, it's outreach, and it's community leadership. And there would be goals in each of those areas um, for a parish to, to mark off. And at the end of that, they're presented with an award. And there are six awards, two introductory, and then four which involve a lot more work. One of the good things about it is that we found it starts with low-hanging fruit. So it starts with things that are very achievable and then works up gradually. So once you've said, oh, well, we can do that, you gain a little bit more knowledge and experience and, and, and the motivation to do some harder things. And in your Paris in particular, what are you kind of focusing on? Well, um, one of the things we, we focus on was we, we looked at the, um, we've done an energy, or energy audit of the parish. Um, so we've provided ourselves with a baseline. Um, this is what we use. Um, and then we're going to try and see how we can reduce that. The other thing is to, Angler Green have suggested um, investigating changing your energy provider to a more greener provider. So um, Angler Green um, recommend Diamond Energy. They're the top of the list. Um, so we're in the process of changing our electricity provider to someone who is more, um, uh, their green credentials are a lot better. Um, we've, as I said, purchased a, an EV vehicle. Now we're in Solution Parish, we're an inner city parish. We've got some funds behind us. We're able to do those type of things. Not every parish can do that, but that was one of the things we decided to do. Um, we're looking at the creation of a community garden. We're establishing what we're calling the Christchurch Institute, which will be a, a vehicle by which we will be running lectures and discussions and seminars on a range of issues of, of connection to the wider community. Our launch event will be on the 6th of October this year around St Francis Tide and we'll be having retired Anglican Bishop George Browning come and give a lecture on uh, the church and the environment, where to from here, mm -hmm. caught between Extinction Rebellion and Climate Denial. Um, so that's that's something else we're doing. Um, um, yeah, so these uh, congregation where we'll be uh, using following through on the season of creation, um, which runs from September 1 through to October 4. Um, we'll be uh, having a, a series of sermons and, and liturgies based on the creation for each of those uh, five Sundays. And then they'll be finished with our, our pets blessing. Um, community leadership's about actually providing, well, we're, we're trying to establish a community garden um, and an outdoor labyrinth, an outdoor chapel area uh, using the, the nature that we've got. So there's some of the things I've started. I've only been here eight months, but um, it's a passion of mine. And I think uh, that my goal would be for this parish to be the greenest parish in the diocese. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're very kind, David. Blessings to you and to all those who are listening. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, like I said, I, I'd love the a ASCM to grow and to foster and become a, uh, a viable alternative to the Christian Union. So 